Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. The holiday specials continue on WWTV. Before we get started, if you're enjoying the knowledge nuggets I'm dropping in my shows and just digging what I'm screaming here, smash that like button and subscribe and spread the word to all your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Thanksgiving this year in the U.S. will be the most challenging in a very, very long time, if not ever. The pandemic here in the United States is getting worse right when people are gearing up to have either their traditional family feast at home or visit a restaurant. Many states are already going to some sort of lockdown, restricting a restaurant's ability to operate before the holiday. In addition to that, every day we are getting more advice to limit private gatherings to only a small number of people or just even those in your own household. Some states are making these policies effective immediately, while others are waiting till after Thanksgiving. For us, well, we're staying at home and getting takeout from the same Italian restaurant we got my birthday dinner from because, well, that's what Italian Americans do as far as eat Italian food. By the way, that's the Life with Mark episode. We may have two friends come over that have effectively self-isolated, except to go to a grocery store or other essential errands. Most likely, however, we'll just be myself and my father. I encourage you to be as safe as possible no matter how you choose to celebrate this year. And I do mean celebrate. I know I personally have a lot to be thankful for. First and foremost is my health and that of my father's. Until recently, none of my relatives have tested positive for COVID-19 that we know of. Second, or really an extension of the first, is that no one I am close to has been infected by COVID-19. Uh, third, uh, is that I never lost my job. I'm considered an essential worker. If I had stayed in the restaurant industry, I cannot say that I would have still had a job. My employer just before my current one has basically shut down. I may have has still had a job, but very likely I would have been furloughed. The place before that did shut down for a short period of time and then did take out, but the managers there stayed on and took a pretty severe pay cut, almost equivalent to what I took working where I work now. And with more potential lockdowns on the horizon, there's a lot of uncertainty in that industry. Fourth is that despite what looks to be a difficult winter coming up, there is light at the end of the tunnel with some promising vaccines. I also read a couple days ago that with few exceptions, anyone that has been infected with COVID-19 will very likely have multi-year immunity. Combined with vaccines, we could see COVID-19 become very preventable and maybe even more. Now, that's just my non-expert opinion, so don't quote me on that. Anyway, you know what I'm an expert on? Yeah, you guessed it. Eating and drinking. <laughs> so let's get into some hopefully awesome wines and what should be a fairly traditional Thanksgiving meal. All right, so here's the deal. With a lot of people out there not being able to gather with their families and friends, cooking a large turkey with all the trimmings may not make sense, but you still have to want to have something close, right? Now, there are some places that kind of anticipated this, that, that uh, raised turkeys, and they were either harvesting them early or they were purposefully uh, trying to make sure that the turkeys were smaller. I also saw that some of the places were cutting them in half. Many supermarket chains make these dinner for one meals. Now, back in the day, we'd probably call these TV dinners and they were like frozen and we still have frozen dinners, but these are higher quality meals. I've had a few and they were well-prepared meals. A couple were just okay. It's hard to replace a truly home cooked meal with something in microwave, but we're in an unusual situation, right? If I didn't live with my father, I'd be in a situation of having to fend for myself. I lived alone for a couple decades in a few cities other than San Antonio and working in an industry that makes it almost impossible to travel out of town to visit family for any of the holidays. So I know all too well what it's like to have a frozen pizza or a TV dinner for Thanksgiving or Christmas in a small apartment by yourself. It freaking sucks. So if there's a fifth thing I'm thankful for is that I've been able to spend my holidays with family here in San Antonio. I've had to work on the actual day for much of that time, but now I'm at a place that is closed for Christmas and closed at two o'clock on Thanksgiving. So even if I did have to work on Thanksgiving, I'd be home by 2.30. So that's what this episode is about. Single people, couples, or very small families where a large dinner isn't realistic. With that said, even if you are lucky enough to need that 10, 12, 15, 20 pound turkey with all the trimmings, I've got you covered with the wine. Now I'm gonna give you the information about the wines first, 
and then I'll taste the wines and then do the pairing. So what that means is you don't see any food here. So when I finish the wines, when I tell you about the wines, I'm going to go heat up the meal. I'm going to bring it here and we're going to do the pairing. Okay. First off, I was approached by Ferrari, the winery, not the car company. They make champagne method sparkling wines in the Trentino Alto Adige region of Italy. Let's take a look while I drop some knowledge nuggets of the area. By the way, Google Earth has been really flaky creating these videos for this episode, so I'm not sure if I'm using it in ways that it's not intended to be used or what. I've tried to eliminate as much of the glitching as possible, but some of it's just unavoidable. The region is in the northeast part of Italy. Alto Adige is in the north and Trentino is in the south part. The Lombardy region is to the west and Veneto is to the east. Austria is over the mountains to the north. The Ferrari winery is in the town of Trento. Across the street from the winery are some vineyards. Their site mentions mountainside vineyards, and these would qualify. Not sure if they own those, but the picture on the website looks like it could be from the same mountain peak in the, with the same mountain peak in the background. It was founded in 1902 by Giulio Ferrari with the intent to make champagne method sparkling wine that would compete with the best French champagne. The Trento DOC is Matodo Classico only DOC. He is also credited with being the first to have substantial plantings of Chardonnay in Italy. In 1952, having no heirs, he chose Bruno Lunelli to take over the business. During the 1970s to the 2000s, they expanded the lineup of wines, including the one I'm going to taste. The Lunelli family continues to own the winery to this day. They sent me two wines. The original email talked about pairing with pizza. I'm sure they both go great with that. Today, we are going to do the rosé. I may use the Brut for Christmas or New Year's, or maybe I'll just pair it with some of the best pizza in San Antonio. That'd be known as Florio's. So let's talk about the wine. We have the non-vintage Ferrari Rosé. Suggested retail price is $35.99. It's 60% Pinot Noir, 40% Chardonnay. It's hand harvested uh, at the end of August to the beginning of September. 20 months uh, lees aging. It's 12.5% alcohol, and the first year production is 1969. So why a rosé sparkling wine? It, well, it's a great palate cleanser and starter. I chose the rosé over the regular route because I felt it would be a better pairing with turkey, stuffing, sweet potatoes, that kind of stuff. There should be a savoriness to it that will go well. So for wine number two, I went mostly traditional, a winery that kind of has a special place in my heart, as Trimbach. Now, back in 2017, I had the pleasure of meeting and tasting with Julian Trimbach. For the full story, I've linked to my interview with him in the description below. The short version is that they've been making wine in Alsace since 1626. They are located in the town of Riboville, or Riboville. Uh, they are considered one of the top wineries in Alsace, with their top bottling being Clos saint hun They also make a reason called Cuvée Frederick Emile. We affectionately call it Freddie Emile here in the States. That's from two Grand Cru vineyards right behind the winery. And while they make amazing wine from a few different grapes, Riesling is really the one they are best known for. And this one does not break the bank. So let's get into what it is and the reason for the pairing. It's the 2016 Trimbach Riesling. You can get it for around 20 bucks, give or take a couple dollars. 100% Riesling, it's dry. It's residual sugar is six grams per liter. Now that's coming from the LCBO website. That's a Canadian wine shop that sends out every wine it sells to an independent lab for testing. So this is the, this is the, measurement they got for this vintage. Uh, and the ABV is 12.5%. Riesling is a classic wine for Thanksgiving, but normally we would go to Germany for it. Now, German Riesling can be any sweetness level from dry to dessert wine sweet. Much of it will be in what they call the fruity style over there. We would think of it as like off dry, not really sweet, but not really dry. Many people think Riesling is very sweet and there's plenty of that, but those still harken back to the days of Blue Nun. So yeah, Merlot, you think you got it bad? Yeah. Anyway, Riesling is one of the best food pairing wines and the dry slaw from Alsace, which is by law, is a great pairing. Now it won't be bone dry in this case. Six grams per liter isn't truly dry, but it will come across as, as drier than some other wines at, at the sugar level. This is because of the higher acid that Riesling has compared to a lot of other grapes. It's really a balancing act. The combination of fruits that Riesling has paired with the sweet and savory flavors of everything on this plate that you haven't seen yet is just about as perfect as you can get, at least in theory. I, I wrote the script assuming the plate was going to be in front of me. And then I realized, ah, I'm going to have cold food. All right. So 
time for an audible. Now, originally I was going to review a crew Beaujolais. Um, I was going to record this episode on November 18th, but I changed my mind that day to record it on this day, which is the 21st. Because of that, what is known as Beaujolais Day happened. That day uh, is when Beaujolais Nouveau is released to the world. This is the third Thursday of November. Very coincidentally, we celebrate our Thanksgiving exactly one week later. So what's Beaujolais Nouveau? Well, let's go to the Book of Knowledge for more. As the Book of Knowledge states, as far back as the 1800s, Beaujolais growers and winemakers would gather to celebrate the end of the harvest by toasting the vintage with some of the young wine produced that year. This is part of the French tradition of Vin de Premier, or early wines, released in the same year as Harvest, which actually 55 appellations in French are allowed to do. During this time, Lyonnais barkeepers and restaurateurs had been in the habit of buying barrels of this new Beaujolais wine that had been pressed in September and ready to serve in November. The new wine was served via pitchers dipped in barrels. The barrels were sometimes transported simply by floating them down the Seine River. Now, once the Beaujolais AOC was established in 1937, the AOC rules meant that Beaujolais wine could only be officially sold after December 15th in the year of the harvest. These rules were relaxed in 1951 in the Union Interprofessionale des Vins du Beaujolais, or the UIVB, formally set November 15th as the release date for what would henceforth be known as Beaujolais Nouveau. In 1985, the INAO, which is the overall body of uh, regulation in France, established the third Thursday of November to allow for a uniform release date for the wine. The wine used to be released from France at 12.01 a.m. on the third Thursday of November. Now, during the 2000s, the release rules started to be relaxed with the wine shipped ahead of time and released to the local markets at 12.01 a.m. local time. Now, this past decade, it started to be sent to retailers ahead of time on the third Thursday with the instruction to not sell it until the third Thursday. So that's the history. Now, what Wikipedia doesn't tell us is that much of this was also to establish some quick cash flow to the producers of the area. Also, not in Wikipedia, was Georges de Boeuf's uh, role. So back in the 50s, when the UIVB relaxed the rules, a race began in seeing who could get the wine to Paris first. This part's actually in the Wikipedia entry. However, by the 70s, de Boeuf really capitalized on this and was the biggest marketer of the wine. So. He's kind of thought of as the inventor of Beaujolais Nouveau, but as you can see, he didn't invent it. He just capitalized on it. He also came up with the phrase, the new Beaujolais has arrived, which I'm not going to try to pronounce the French, uh, and which has been used until 19, I'm sorry, which was used until 2005 when it was changed to it's Beaujolais Nouveau time. De Bouffe is the largest produ producer of Nouveau and is known for an abstract flowery label. Um, now, sadly, Georges passed away earlier this year. So what about the wine I'm going to use? Well, it comes from Joseph Druin, as how we pronounce it here in the United States. It's pronounced kind of like drone, but with like a in, so like droin or drone. Something, it, I can't do the French pronunciation properly, but Druin is fine. It's kind of like my last name. We say Fusco, but in Italy it's Fusco. But that's an easy, that's easy to say. <laughs> but anyway, so why use this one instead of Debuff? Well, last year, was the first time I'd had Nouveau in quite a while. And of the two to three I tried last year, this one I thought was the best tasting, at least to my palate. In addition to that, it was the cheapest of the group where, uh, that was available where I bought it. So this bottle retails for $11.95 and that's after a discount. So Beaujolais Nouveau seems to have gone up in price recently. Granted, some of that is, you know, attributed to, or could be attributed to the 25% tariffs that happened this year, but not all of it. Plus some of the ones I saw were the Lodge level. So I guess they're more expensive, but I've never really noticed a Village level Nouveau. I'm, it's, I'm sure it's existed for a long time. I just really have never noticed it. Anyway, what about Druin? They were founded in 1880 when Joseph Druin was 22. They are located in the city of Bone with cellars under the wine museum. I remember walking past them in 2017 on a Saturday after going into that museum. There's really nothing spectacular to show via Google Earth, so we won't see any video for that. Anyway, they are one of the most respected producers in Burgundy. They have vineyard holdings throughout Burgundy and work with many growers too. They also practice organic farming on their own vineyards. They make wines from everywhere in Burgundy, from Chablis to Beaujolais. Yes, Beaujolais is legally part of Burgundy. They also have a property in the Dundee Hills uh, in Oregon. They make spectacular wines on both continents. 
This wine is a 2020 Joseph Drone Beaujolais Nouveau. It's 100% Gamay. It's carbonic maceration, hand harvest by law. The residual sugar is, according to LCBO, two grams per liter. Uh, it's 13% ABV. Carbonic maceration is a whole berry anaerobic fermentation which emphasizes fruit flavors without extracting the bitter tannins from the grape skins. Two grams per liter of RS is pretty dry. Now, this was taken from the LCBO website and their label uh, looks a little different than this one, but I'm sure it's the same wine. Anyway, Beaujolais Nouveau is generally regarded as a sweet wine, but that's not necessarily due to a high sugar content. We perceive fruit and forward wines as sweet when they are technically dry, and it's kind of very, it's very confusing to a lot of people. When I get to the wine, we'll see how uh, sweet it tastes. Now, why use this for Thanksgiving? Well, that fruity flavor can pair very well with typical Thanksgiving fare, especially with cranberry sauce. Now, Nouveau is very easy drinking, has low tannins due to the way it's produced. Now, like I've already said, I'm not necessarily a fan of this style of wine, but Druin's from last year was pretty decent. Okay, now let's get into each wine and how well it pairs with the food. So I'm gonna go ahead and, um, I'm gonna go ahead and open the wines, I'm gonna taste them, and then I'm gonna heat my food up and we're gonna go from there. All right, so the first one is the Ferrari. Now this is warmed up a little bit, so um, it was not as ice cold as it was when I took it out of the fridge. So that, in some ways it should be, that's, that's good because it'll, the flavors should come out a little bit better, but you may hear the, it may, you may hear the pop a little bit more. Let's see, let's see if I can get that. Up, oh, I feel a lot of pressure coming. Eh, it's not so bad. All righty. As per usual, especially when evaluating wines with sparkling wines, I'm using a regular glass. These are just good universal glasses. I don't think I've really talked about these glasses. I got bought these from Wine Folly. A set of six, I think, cost like 125. So they're not cheap by any means, but I have a consistent glass to use every time instead of like this mishmash of like Libby glasses I bought at Walmart. Um, they, and they look nice. And I mean, I, I, since I have six of these, I tend to drink out of these on a regular basis, but I just pull whatever wine glass I have that's available. Anyway, so, um, you know, I got a really nice salmon color on this and um, I believe it was 60% Pinot and 40% Chardonnay. So on the nose, you've got that really, I mean, remember this is champagne method. So you've got that really um, uh, great nose on there with the Lees aging. You've got that really great bakery brioche um, aroma to it. I also get that really great kind of strawberry and red berries on the fruit. And, and I kind of, that's why I like really sparkling wines, especially champagne or champagne method rosés, because the brutes, the non rosés sometimes are, I want to say one dimensional, but they don't necessarily have that red berry fruit that I really like out of rosé. Now, hey, I'm not going to turn down champagne of any color or just really good sparkling wine of any color. But yeah, I, I tend to gravitate towards rosés a lot. So yeah, I get that really good, right, nice berry uh, aromas and that good bakery and brioche type of thing. Let's, uh, let's see how it tastes. This wine's legit. So you've got that strawberry, cranberry, raspberry, and these are, they're somewhat of a tart nature, but you really taste the fruit. Now, if I remember correctly, I'm going to look up, I'm going to look up the RS real quick on this because I don't remember being a really high RS, but I'm going to look it up real quick. Oh, I don't have the RS on it. And it's, I think it's listed as Brut on the front. It doesn't say. Now, it's not sweet as Brut. So it's got, it can have up to 12 grams per liter sugar you taste the fruit and they didn't list the, um, uh, the RS on their, on their website. And this is, was not, I could not find that on LCBL's website. So I couldn't get what their analysis was, but yeah, I would say this might be on the higher end of the RS, but I would say it's like 12. It might be like nine to 10.
But what that does is it balances the acidity. This is still a very acidic wine, and it should be. That's what you want for sparkling wine. It might be a little bit lower than that. It might be just that first attack had a little bit of uh, perceived sweetness. Now it's really in balance. And that's the goal of how much of that dosage you put in there to, to really balance out the wine. And a lot of it is like seasoning to taste. The winemaker, the cellar master might have a certain style that they want to preserve, or it might be just a personal preference, especially if they're the founding uh, winemaker of, of the winery. And maybe that's what they like. Like Bruno Parry loves Brut Nature, like zero dosage. And that's awesome. I love zero dosage. But that doesn't mean that that's the best. Sometimes having a little bit of dosage, you know, having a little bit of sugar in there to balance things out is what's needed. Anyway, this wine is super delicious. Like I said, you get the, the, the great berries that, that Brioche comes through again on the, uh, the palate. And the texture, you have really the fine, the fine bubbles like you would get with Champagne Method. So yeah, it's absolutely delicious. And I anticipate, again, one of the things about sparkling wine is texture, not just of the wine, but when you pair it with food, it can be a really good compliment. All right, let's do the Riesling. So the, the 2016 Trimbach Riesling. This was a great, great visit when I went up to Alsace. That was a three hour each way drive from Bone. I didn't have any other appointments that day. And it was actually my first appointment of the day. I mean, first appointment of the whole trip. And I had, I had gotten into Bone around six, seven o'clock that night, the night before, had dinner. And I woke up at like at five in the morning and I'm totally fine because I just don't get jet lag. I also don't get hangovers. So it's good to be me. The traditional style hangover. It doesn't mean I'm not affected the next day, but it really doesn't affect me that much. All right. So, oh, I am so psyched about having this wine here. So true and true to form with Riesling, you get that um, petrol. We like, we call it petrol. In this case, it has kind of like that, that um, uh, it is a bit of a shower curtain thing. Um, and that's a good thing. But also has like that kind of wax, like the, when you, I was a kid, the zoo had those, those uh, wax animals it would make in the machine. And it had that, and when it was hot, it had that hotter wax type of smell to it. So you've got that. You've also got some citrus, some peach, little orange nectarine. The fruit is really kind of behind the the uh, petrol, or it's TDN is the actual chemical compound that that produces this, um, and that's fine. This is one of those I would I would nose and be like, oh, I got riesling. Now, where does it come from? That that would be the, that would be the uh, the guessing game at this point. There's a bit of savoriness to it. Almost like a fresh cut grass on the lawnmower from the gasoline. See, there you go. All right, let's taste it. So now the fruit cup really starts coming through. The acidity is, is up there. Mix your mouth water, which means your mouth is ready to go when it's time to get some food in your mouth, right? Or to drink more. So you've got like, I think it's literally fruit cup. So it's kind of like, it's not sweet, okay? But you have that kind of almost syrupy, like the fruit cup you would get as a kid that has like the grapes and the little cherries and the, the uh, apple and the pear 
and the pineapple and all that kind of stuff. It's all in there. Orange, nectarine, it's all in there. I mean, one of my mentors said, if you get a fruit cup, Riesling should be at least in the conversation, especially if it's a high acid grape. If it's not a high acid grape, then or wine is probably not Riesling, but oh yeah. And as per usual, no new oak on this. Uh, I think this is, I think this is probably stainless and concrete. Um, I don't, the, on their, on their higher end ones, they may have some large fudras or large neutral barrels, but I'm pretty sure for this, it's just, it's concrete. The savoriness isn't so much on the, on the palate. I don't necessarily get that fresh cut grass. Um, but if it stayed in a savory note and maybe even like a tarragon or something like that, I might have taken this to Austria because Austria tends to have dry Rieslings for the most part, but they can be sweet too. They tend to have a, they tend to have a, um, a greener herbaceousness to it. Whereas Alsace tastes like sunshine because it's the sunniest place in France. It has the most sunlight hours of anywhere in France because of the Vosges Mountains and the rain shadow effect, which that's another story. But this wine is spectacular. I cannot wait to pair this with food. All right, the drone or Druin. Alrighty. Now, one of the things you'll notice with, if you get Beaujolais Nouveau, is it has this really, really, like, almost electric purple look to it. And that's really too, due to the carbonic maceration. Uh, it's It looks very much like grape juice. Uh, you, you don't really have a lot of you have enough skin contact to get the color, but you haven't had enough time for that color to kind of become a more ruby or garnet color that, let's say, Cru Beaujolais would, would have. All right. Um, there might be, I mean, granted, I use the Corvin on this. There might be a little bit of carbonation to it from the carbonic maceration, but it should be like completely, uh, there should be like no gas, but you still might get a little bit from that, okay? So highly aromatic, okay? And you really get just a, a wall of ripe, fresh fruit. It's, it's like you just picked the fruits and it's this fruit basket and you just shoved it in your, in your mouth or in your nose, honestly. So you're getting raspberry, cranberry, blackberry, blueberry, Bubble gum, which is a, a big marker for carbonic maceration. Some people get like banana. I get a little banana Laffy Taffy. Yeah, that's in there. A little Laffy Taffy's in there. A little bit of rose petal. A little bit of floral out of this. Uh, fresh, like really fresh floral. Red fruits. And while it's not while they don't put like new oak aging on this, it probably sat in like a neutral barrel, probably sat in stainless. But I also feel like because of all the, the processes from the carbonic maceration, there's like this woodsy, a wood quality to it, but not from wood aging. It's kind of hard to explain. Almost like a furniture polish thing, right? Like a lemon pledge. I haven't used that in a while. Anyway, let's taste it. So this is grandma's wine, okay? It's actually not sweet. It's actually pretty dry, but it tastes sweet, right? It, it has those fruit flavors. This is, you know, Uncle John, Aunt May, Grandma, they, they don't like wine, but they'll like this because it's not bitter. It's not tannic. There's a little, the tiniest of grip to it, right? It lets you know it's wine still. It's not grape juice, right? Um, but absolutely very fruit forward. I mean, for what it is, it tastes pretty good. 
this is not be something I would go every day, but to me, this is not, I could drink most wine by themselves. This one, I really need to pair food with it because I need that balancing act with the really, really fruity, very fruit forward style that's still dry, but I need something to counteract that. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and heat up my food, get it on a proper plate, and we're gonna do the wines with the food. Okay, so I got a new, I got a third glass, that way I have one glass for each wine. I've got my turkey dinner here, and I'll show it to you here in a second, but it's turkey, uh, green beans with almonds, uh, sweet potatoes, and stuffing. And it's, it fills the plate. So, I mean, there's, there's definitely a lot of, a lot of stuff going on with this. All right. This is actually my dinner tonight. So I'm recording this. It's about eight o'clock. So it, I'm eating dinner a little bit later than normal, but I started doing all the prep work around seven. So, da, da, da. so you can see the plate. So I brought the fancy plate out, you know, not the normal plate we use. I even got my fancy silverware and a, an actual napkin. Anyway, um, so turkey, you have your green beans with the, with the almonds, your stuffing, and your sweet potatoes. So I said it fills the plate, and you really got a good portion of food here. All right, so what I'm going to do is, for texture first, I'm going to do the, 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 uh, the stuffing with the rosé, which is sparkling wine. So that goes really well. So fried foods, breading, that kind of stuff, and sparkling wine go really well. Texture-wise, it's great. I would say with the turkey, it should be another home run. It goes really well with that. We'll try a little sweet potato with it. I'm not the biggest sweet potato fan, but it's part of tradition, right? That is a great pairing right there. So the red fruits with the sweet potato is fantastic. A little green bean. That works. It's a little herbaceousness with that, but I think it works because this is a little bit of savory in that. Now let's do it with the, um, let's do it the reasoning real quick. Now the one thing that kind of sucks about these types of dinners, the instructions say heat for one to two minutes on high in the microwave. I did three. This is not hot, but in the interest of getting this done, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to reheat this. I'm going to put it on a plate that doesn't have metal on it and put on a new plate and uh, reheat it. You know what I forgot? The cranberry sauce, which is fine because I don't need it yet for, for this pairing. But it would help with the turkey. Oh, wow. So turkey's kind of a neutral, kind of a neutral protein. I mean, it has a flavor to it, obviously, but man, the wine just really got enhanced with that. The fruit characteristics is really, really just kind of just left out. This wine is going great with everything. 
what's happening is the food's like enhancing the wine. Now you want a balancing act between the food and the wine, but everything is like taking, the, the food is enhanced too. It's like taking the food and the wine to like another level, like the, you know, the sum is greater than the parts, right? potatoes okay i expect that the um the green bean should be really really good the green beans good you know what goes even better with green beans gruner so i'm gonna get up and get the um cranberry sauce real quick okay I'm back Cranberry sauce and the little plastic ramekin. Because you don't want to heat the cranberry sauce, right? I mean, I don't know. I'm throw a little bit onto the turkey. That'll help. I don't want to do too much because I'm going to reheat this. There we go. Slather that on there. Now, let's actually kind of dip it in the cranberry sauce. That's what I should have done. All right. I bet you this is going to be spectacular. That's the jam right there. One of the things I didn't mention, because it smells like fermentation. It's exactly what it smells like. It's like if you've ever been in a winery and there's active fermentation going on, that's what this smells like. I'm going to get another bite here. Throw it into the little, little dip and dunk. And go back to this. It definitely works. That fruity and fruity. Now let's we'll see how this breading goes as I dump it all over the the table. This might go really well. Again, that really fruity characteristic. The stuffing is. Not sweet, but there's a bit of sweetness to the stuffing. I bet you the sweet potato is probably going to be the best pairing of all. It really enhances the sweet potato. You get that sweetness there. Um, it, does, it does a really good job. Not my favorite wine, not my favorite part of Thanksgiving dinner. But it's a good pairing. And then a little green bean. This one, I'm not sure how this is going to go, but because it's so vegetal. But we'll see. Well, actually, that's not bad. It works. Again, it's a balancing act. You got the bitterness of the Green beans with the fruity, Swedish, not Swedish, like already heard, but sweet ish uh, style of wine. It works. All right. Not bad. Not bad at all. Well, I'm going to reheat all this, get a little bit warmer. I'm probably going to give myself healthy portions of the rest of these wines watch some TV, and chill. So yeah, so that's going to be the show today. Again, if you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe and tell your friends. And then until next time, cheers, salute, salute, however you want to call it. Have a good time and happy Thanksgiving. Be safe.